This is the Jeff Santos Show. Mr. President, uh, this morning on Twitter, you were referring to the testimony of James Comey vindicating you. But I wondered if you could tell us in person, sir, why you feel that his testimony vindicated you when it's really boils down to his word against your word. And if you could also tell us, sir, are, do tapes exist of your conversations yeah. with him? Well, I'll tell you about that maybe sometime in the very near future. But uh, in the meantime, no collusion, no obstruction. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I know I was fired because of something about the way I was conducting the Russia investigation was in some way putting pressure on him in some way irritating him and he decided to fire me because of that. I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting. I was so stunned by the conversation that I just took it in. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. Uh, it's the great work of our good friend MTC, the Renaissance man, Mark Taylor Canfield, the reporter, the investigative journalist, the man who makes the great music, the activist. He is Mr. Renaissance man. He is uh, on the air with us, as usual, on Tuesdays at 530 MTC is in the house. MTC, how are you, sir? Ron, thanks for playing my song, Total Lack of Recall. You can see that <laughs> video on YouTube. It's the takeoff from the Arnold Schwarzenegger sci-fi movie, Total Recall, only in this case it was Total Lack of Recall. And I just, I just want to say this too, Jeff, that after all this time, I really think that Donald Trump was guilty of obstruction of justice when he fired James Comey as head of the uh -huh. FBI. Yeah, I agree. And James Comey was trying to tell us that during his testimony, and I try to feature that in this video to show. And he was trying to say without saying, you've got to prosecute this guy. Unfortunately, neither Barr nor Mueller decided to do that, and I think that set us on the present course and the disaster we're facing today. You got that right. Uh, talk about people not doing their job, including the, uh, the United States Senate as well. You can put them into that uh, category, too. I just think that we are facing this horrific situation, and I don't know if anybody in Washington State has taken Lysol and decided to use it as a disinfectant uh, to get rid of the virus. But I'm just concerned that, follow up on your point, that we have somebody who's out of control in the White House, and that that's going to have complications over the next six months. Can we trust him to run an honest election? Can we entrust Mr. Barr to be the oversight? Our good friend Greg Palace has identified a number of states, Florida and Ohio, are amongst them, two key swing states that potentially could be corrupted by the, the Trumps of the world. You can go on and on and on. And, and the fact is, is that, you know, you have an ineffectual, progressive, democratic platform or bullhorn to be able to take this on. We get a very weak presidential candidate uh, who every once in a while comes out of the dungeon to give his softball interviews with mainstream media. I'm just concerned that it's not like you have, in my opinion, a candidate that is ready to go. There, there, there is no JFK uh, sitting in the, in the wings here. No FDR. And you got to replace something with something. And that gives me more pause. Well, Jeff, you know, there is a book out right now, um, and it's by Megan Day and Micah Utrich, and it's called Bigger Than Bernie. And it's all about this sort of democratic socialist movement, progressive movement that I've been talking about, which has been quite prevalent in the Northwest for a long time and where it's going to go from here. So I, I highly recommend people to check it out. It, it was featured in, in these times, and it's just one of those responses, I think, that people are putting together to try to say, this is not about one candidate. This is about the future of the country, and regardless of who's in the White House right now. And by the way, Jeff, I should say this as well as a journalist, set the record straight. His attorney at the time accused James Comey of leaking illegal classified information. 
However, there were no prosecutions on that for some reason, and uh, no evidence was ever found of that. So Trump says a lot of things that just are hot air. He said that the first thing he was going to do when he got elected was what? Put Hillary Clinton in prison. So did we see any of that happen? No. He just says it because he thinks it sounds good at the moment, and by the next day he probably forgets what he said. Right. So I'm well, sorry. I mean, that was, that's that was the a America Republican that we're dealing with today. Talking point that if in case Hillary won, that was the, what they were going to try to do. But you know, he, he obviously wasn't going to be able to to make that happen publicly. It would you know it'd be a PR disaster for him. But here, where I think you know, I agree with the the Democratic Socialist of America. Although I I still have a problem with the idea of of it being defined as it's been currently defined. And some will take the extreme measures of connecting it to Fidel Castro and his cigar. And I think that there needs to be an education. I was talking with somebody earlier today about the fact that Bernie Sanders missed the boat time and time again in the campaign when he didn't follow the advice of Michael Moore, who Michael Moore, when introducing AOC at that great Queens rally with 35,000 people, still the largest event of the primary uh, and will probably be of the general too, in 1990 Bernie was running for Congress he asked uh, Bernie Sanders what is the definition of democratic socialism is. And Bernie said, well, it's what the Democrats used to be. Do you know that Michael Moore never was quoted as far as I know, uh, and I've watched a lot of his appearances on MSNBC and other places, never talked about it again. The Democratic Party, the, uh, the campaign of Bernie never talked about it again. To me, that is a central piece because you've got a bunch of people, Mark, over the age of 60 who identify socialism with Fidel and Stalin and the rest of the crowd. And I think if we're going to be able to message better, as one of our callers, Mark from San Francisco, mentioned earlier, the Democrats are not doing, then, you know, the Democratic Socialists, for all their great ideas, better understand how to talk about what that means. Because otherwise, they're never even going to get the first base with people over the age of 50. And the last time I checked, there's still a lot of them, as well as there are about 25-year-olds. So that's my concern. I, I just think that that has to be said. It is bigger than democratic socialism as, as well. I mean, I don't think that one phrase or one quick, easy political term can describe what's going on. Some people describe themselves as progressive Democrats. Some people describe themselves as progressive independents. Some people describe themselves as uh, democratic socialists. But what I'm concerned about, Jeff, is some very basic things. For instance, I found out that a friend of mine had their phone service suspended yesterday because of lack of payment. Yeah. And it's a family plan, and there's somebody on that family plan who's disabled and needs access to you know medical care. So I, I thought that was ridiculous. Now, as of today, it's back on. So I don't know whether that particular carrier, whether they just received a payment or what happened, but I'm really worried about that because it's one thing to lose your Internet connection, but if you have no phone connection, how are you going to contact emergency services? So let's one thing. The other thing is that, and by the way, I feel a little bit like I've just been gone through the Great Depression like some of my ancestors who literally moved from Kentucky when all, all the coal mines closed down and everybody got evicted from the farms and their homes, and they moved west. So they moved to Michigan, didn't like the weather in the winter there, uh, was hard for farmers, you know, which is what they were trying to do. So then they came out west to the northwest, to the Pacific Northwest, and that's how a lot of us got here, is there was a huge migration like the Grapes of Wrath. Instead of going to California, though, people came to the northwest. Right. And I, but I can report that there is a God, Jeff, because I do have, I have hand sanitizer, <laughs> and I feel a little bit like the, the universe is smiling on me finally. But we have a big issue here in Seattle where Shama Swan, our council member, now there's a big hearing tomorrow before the city council where she really wants the city to tax Amazon. It's this constant battle between Shama Sawan and Amazon over over taxes. You know, this corporation that apparently didn't pay any taxes last year, but she's trying to get the city to pass a tax in order to partly fund the COVID relief 
efforts through attacks on big corporations and Amazon. And so tomorrow there's a hearing, and she asked me if I wanted to testify. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to do that because I'm kind of more focused as a journalist right now on the story. But there's a big effort to stop evictions, to stop utility cutoffs. Governor Jay Inslee has been in on that as well. But I'm concerned a little bit about phone service because I haven't heard anybody talk about what happens when elderly and disabled people and people who are struggling with all of a sudden can't use their phone. And that is not right, Jeff. And what we're all learning is that what's not good for one person is going to affect all of us. That's the lesson from this pandemic. And and that's what Governor Jay Inslee has been trying to tell us. That's what our Congresswoman from Village Ayapal has been trying to tell us. That's what the mayor's been trying to tell us. But apparently, according to Shama Swant's latest email, Jenny Durkin thinks that the idea of taxing Amazon is just not going to fly. And that's the whole problem in Seattle, is that you have a few corporations, you know, it used to be Boeing and Microsoft, now it happens to be uh, Amazon, and but Google's right up there too. They have major headquarters here. Everybody thinks Seattle's a very innovative place where they can recruit a lot of very good software engineers and technical people, and yet there's this lack of sense of responsibility for the community sometimes that we see, which is this big libertarian sort of tenant, you know, that, ah, you just go in and do business and hire and fire people and you have no responsibility for causing all the rents to skyrocket in the city and mass homelessness and all these other issues. Well, Shama so on, and it just happens to be that she's in the Democratic Socialist Party, the Socialist Alternative Party. They are trying to get the city to finally come to terms with this, and it's an ongoing battle. I mean, I was reporting on this last year, remember during the city council election, when Amazon dropped like a million and a half dollars in the last few days of the election trying to sway it. And it, which didn't work very well, by the way. The, the most of their candidates actually lost, and one of them said that he regretted taking their money because they thought it was a big mistake. But you know, I think these are the kind of issues that people are dealing with all across the country. When when you look at the fact that the current monopoly capitalism system, which isn't even free enterprise, is failing, and it's failing poor folks, it's failing people of color, it's failing. Elderly people, disabled people, people in the healthcare industry. I mean, come on, we got to do a lot better than this. Now, Reporters Without Borders just released their uh, World Press Freedom Index, and we actually, and believe it or not, improved by a couple <laughs> places on that list, believe it or not, under the current <laughs> regime. But that's only because other countries are so bad, <laughs> so it's not really a fair comparison. In fact, China which is ranked 177th in the world out of 180 countries, put out an official statement rebuking, reproaching Reporters Without Borders, saying, hey, we're very welcoming of journalists, you know, kind of ignoring the fact that they just kicked out 13 of them. But, you know, uh, we we understand that one thing that China and uh, Donald Trump have in common is that you can't always take what they say (laughs) verbatim. And you can't always take what they say as the truth because they like to spin. They like to spin a lot. And so sad, but the United States actually is now 45th in the world, um, which is nothing to be proud of. I mean, that means there are 44 other countries in the world, according to Reporters Without Borders, who have countries where there's more freedom of the press, there's more access to vital information about their own government, there's less uh, censorship and prosecution of whistleblowers, than in the United States. I just keep looking at it like I understand that a lot of the so-called millennials, the young folks in the battle against lack of action on climate change, some of the democratic socialists, they're young folks who see right through all of this, and they understand that it's ridiculous to hear the corporate media talking about how great the country is, Trump talking about making America great again when we're ranked 45th in the world in terms of press freedom. But those are the kind of stories that you're not going to hear in the corporate media. And we continue to do these kind of stories at Democracy Watch News, by the way. We just did. We just released a podcast about conditions in Ethiopia with the the Oromia people. There's a whole population of people in Ethiopia who have traditionally been suppressed. And they've had a big battle with dictatorship there and all sorts of corruption in their government. And you'll never hear about that in American uh, media because they're too busy looking at their own belly button, you know, their own nose, 
They think well, the United States is the only place that exists, apparently. I, I think it's important to, to say that you guys are one of the very few groups that talk about international issues. And today, our first guest was uh, the former EU ambassador to the United States and the former Irish Prime Minister, John Bruton. I think that it's really important, and I was talking about this before the interview, that the American people not only reach out to you know, programs like this one, but what you're doing uh, and what your colleagues, uh, Dean Edwards and others, are doing on the international front because it's, it's so critically important to know. I often joke that, again, and I think you can understand this, that a lot more people in the United States know who Kim Kardashian is than they know who the vice president of the United States is. You know, a lot of people think Mike Pence may play second base for the Seattle Mariners. That's D. Gordon for those who want to know, but I think he could be a good Red Sox player one, one day. But the fact hey, is, hey. is that uh, I know we're, we'll, we'll give you fair, uh, don't, fair trade value. Don't steal our players anymore. The East Coast <laughs> yeah. is always stealing our great players. Yeah. Jack Ken Griffey Jr. got each row. I didn't the get him. We didn't get him. In Cincinnati know, went home to be with his daddy. But anyways, uh, I hear you. So I just think that it's it's important because and what you guys and and uh, do at Democracy Watch News is so critically important and to support the local independent media. I was also talking to Robert Craig and Robert Borsage about the idea of the progressive movement. I think that the they have to understand Bernie didn't do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it, I think it hurt him in the end. Uh, didn't go on my show. Hasn't been on my show for five years. Hasn't gone on a lot of other shows. I didn't go on Jimmy Dore's show. Or you didn't go on a lot of other uh, programs. And you can't afford to not utilize every platform you can use. And I'm hoping now, and I want to get your thoughts on this, that Ms. Jayapal, in her role as co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, love her policies, she needs to be able to reach out to people. And, and I don't know, maybe it's Mac Lamore. I don't know who it is. But she needs to get people behind her who are not just the Capitol Hill types. Um, you know, and reach out to people, uh, you know, in the music industry and, and, and other people who are not necessarily, you know, in the everyday political circles like you and I and, and many of the people who are on this show talk about. I think this is extremely important, and I don't know if you get a chance to talk to her, but I would hope that she uh, would take that advice because otherwise we're just going to be you know, all these separate groups, DSA here and and uh, pr Democrats here and progressive Democrats of America there and people want to start a new party here and, you know, it, it's going to go nowhere. Part of it is that Pramila, which I, who I do talk to, is uh, she is in a very safe seat in Seattle because that's her district. So she actually is representing those Capitol Hill types and the the progressives in Seattle. So that is her constituency. I think maybe on a national level, if she's thinking about how to affect the country as a whole, then yeah, it might be good to, to reach out. But I think actually, to tell you the truth, Jeff, I think right now she's totally focused on what's happening in Washington State. I know she's got the Medicare for All bill out there and a couple other major bills that she's working on nationally. But First of all, let me say this. I did get a heads up from Democracy Watch News that uh, you were going to have an international guest on today. So I will go back and listen to that. I wasn't able to listen to it when he was on. But I did meet the mayor of Galway, who was the honorary parade marshal for St. Paddy's Day last year, when we mm -hmm. had a St. Paddy's Day march. And I happened to be part of this whole crew that was down there with the Seafair Pirates. They uh, ritually kidnapped uh, St. Patrick. This guy was all dressed up as an abbot or whatever, and they got him, and they got the mayor of Galway, and they put them on their ship, which actually was a pirate ship, and took them down to Pioneer Square and basically forced them to drink a pint of uh, Irish beer or something. But that was part of this tradition, and I got a chance to talk to the mayor of Galway and his wife. He was saying that with the Boris Johnson crowd, that the Labor Party and some of his constituents are dealing with some of the same kinds of, you know, in terms of this right-wing sort of, uh, nationalist BS, you know, that, that they're trying to push there. And that the average person is suffering, and that's happening here, too. And as far as your point about uh, Sanders and reaching out to progressive media, I would think that the progressive movement should have understood, and I've never understood why they don't, that back in when Obama's first election, the progressive media was a huge factor in that election. Yes. And it was after his election that 
Clear Channel and, and CBS and some other folks started selling off those stations and firing all of the progressive talk show hosts, right? Like the Tom Hartmans and the Norman Goldmans and the Randy Woods and all of those people got kicked off the air. Well, they, they, got, they, and, they, they just destroyed the whole format of Air America for the yeah. most part and, and other, other networks. And those all, all the individuals that were connected to them went out the door. I suffered the same fate in Boston. I know the feeling. Yeah, so, and it happened in Seattle. We lost our progressive talk station here. So did Portland. So it, there's been all, an empty space in the media ever since, actually, and the audiences in these progressive cities are just dying for some kind of progressive media that they're not getting. But the corporate people don't seem to understand that, or they have a political agenda, like the St. Clair folks, that has nothing to do with fairness or progressive ideals. It has to do with pushing a right-wing agenda and owning the media, you know, the the Bloombergs of the world, they know how to own the media and make it happen. But and unfortunately, most progressives don't understand the importance of progressive media and don't understand that it was, it was those guys. Even Ron Reagan was out there and had a really progressive talk show and was really changing the mood of the country and, and signaling a change in politics. And for some reason, the progressives just don't get it. There was an effort to try to create progressive radio Northwest here in Seattle when I got involved and Norman Goldman came up and we put on workshops and things trying to explain to people how a lot of a lot of media was going to people's handheld devices and online. But they just wanted to buy a radio station. And that means, you know, they gotta come up with about six million dollars to get a frequency here in Seattle. And that's not the way that the Federal Communications Commission was set up in the beginning. It wasn't supposed to be a corporate monopolized medium. It was supposed to be publicly owned and publicly regulated. That's right. Well, that, that, was, to be. that was the thing. But I think it's even, it's even bigger than that. And I think that this is, goes to the issue of where we're going in terms of fighting against Republicans who obviously put money behind Rush Limbaugh and put money behind right-wing talk radio and Hannity and the rest of them local guys included and the democrats you know ignored that i mean i i was told oh well you know we got it we got npr npr is not going to do anything for you npr is he said she said we got it we got Con congressman uh, johnson here who's uh, a member of the republican party and we got congressman smith of the democratic party now do your debate <laughs> yeah. that's what happens yeah, or Amy Goodman calls it National uh, Pentagon Radio. So you know they tend right. to they were they were too they were not very suspicious about the uh, lies that got us into the Iraq War. Let's put it that way. So yeah, I mean there's a there's a real problem with journalism basically in corporate media. It's not really journalism. It's mostly infotainment, and in a lot of ways it's political propaganda. And the Fox Network is a perfect example of that. But they're all guilty of that to one degree or another, and we saw that with the Chris Matthews <laughs> meltdown over Bernie Sanders. I mean, come on. How can you be some, somehow objective about a real authentic movement in the United States if you are going to be comparing in the Nazis and things, you know? I mean, that was ridiculous. No, they is. just couldn't handle the idea that a progressive could be the leader of the Democratic Party, and they're still fighting that idea. But sooner no, or later, yeah. they're going to understand that if they want uh, growing the party and expanding it, they're going to have to reach out to people outside the Beltway, and like you said, out, outside of D.C. and outside of Capitol Hill, Seattle. I mean, this right. needs to be a populist movement. And I thought that Bernie sort of understood no, that I, when his campaign went into the rural areas and actually won counties during the, the original caucuses here in, in Washington State that had traditionally been Republican. Well, that they, didn't do that, sign, they, they didn't do that very well in, in 2020. we got to run, my friend, but uh, always spot on uh, on your analysis. I appreciate it. And uh, look, we don't need two Republican yeah. parties. Thank you. Check out my YouTube. Check out the NTC Report at YouTube. I always forget to tell people that I have like 400 videos up there. So check it out. And thanks, Jeff. You're doing a great job. We'll do. Thank you. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast, and uh, thank you for listening, folks. We'll be back tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel. Keep on fighting. My name is Jeff Santos, and I gotta go. He's a leaker. Oh, I don't recall. He recalls absolutely nothing. nothing. He recalls absolutely nothing. nothing. I did not have any recollection. I did not remember. I did not remember that. Leaker. Because I thought that might prompt the appointment of a special counsel. I don't recall it. 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 I was honestly concerned that you might lie about the nature of our meeting. That combination of things I'd never experienced before. 
Broadcasting live from the studios at Green, we are AM 1530, WVBF, Middleborough, Taunton, and W259 DD, Middleborough Center, 99.7 FM Radio. Once again, this reminder that there are many ways to listen to the Jeff Santo Show. Since you are hearing this spot, you will be able to listen to the show right here. However, this may be a podcast. To listen live, we may be on your local radio station. If not, please go to our website, revolutionradionetwork.com. Then click to the Listen Live button. Here you will be able to listen live between 3 and 6 p.m. Eastern Time weekdays, 12 to 3 p.m. Pacific Time on weekdays. You will also be able to listen to the previous day's programs just about any time outside of our normal broadcast hours, including weekends. Another way to listen live is to go to TuneIn and search for GAE-1. This is the GAE, or Global American Enterprises, feed. Global American Enterprises is a syndicator of the Jeff Santos Show.